speaker is uh, Professor Joachim Meyer. Um, Joachim is the head of the Department of Industrial Engineering here in Tel Aviv University. And uh, he's actually going to address exactly uh, the question that was asked now. Why should users care? And Joachim is going to talk about uh, cyber insurance. And, uh, and maybe he has a plan to make uh, people care by taking money uh, of them. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so uh, 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 this is work uh, that is being funded by the ICRC as part of an interdisciplinary uh, project. And it is a project that, we, uh, that I do with uh, Ronen Avram from the legal faculty here. Uh, and uh, a lot of the work is done by my student, uh, Shuki Cohen. Uh, so who should pay for the damage from cyber attacks? As someone said there is no damage for our customers, but that's sort of not true if we look, for instance, for ransomware, where actually people have to pay out of pocket to get the, uh, their drives sort of released if this works. So in any case, I'm really happy to sort of have the opportunity to give this final talk here uh, in this academic day, because um, this academic day sort of exemplifies the interdisciplinarity of the field of cybersecurity. Uh, we had talks on technology, we had talks on uh, policy, we had talks on legal aspects, and now we have talks on human behavior. Uh, and they all play uh, a part if we deal with uh, the question, how should people, uh, or how, how should we cope with uh, cyber threats? Now. Um, the threats I'm talking about are threats that, are, that involve users to some extent, right? So many of the recent attacks uh, are somehow related to human behavior. Uh, in 2016, for instance, uh, we see a huge increase in spam messages that have malicious payloads, mainly uh, related to ransomware. Uh, and this is, uh, actually requires people to open this uh, message and do something. And uh, if they do this, then their computer may end up being encrypted. Uh, now, uh, companies very often say that they are willing to some extent to protect pe uh, people, protect the users, even if this is not their core business. Okay? McAfee obviously sells security as their project, but even uh, search engines such as Google uh, now give you some warning about possible phishing. Or uh, the Israelis among us probably know this uh, super parrot from Bezek Ben Lumi uh, that promises that uh, Bezek Ben Lumi will protect you, even though this is not their core business. So we get services from companies, and these companies tell us, well, we somehow protect you against bad things happening. Now, What can these companies do uh, to protect us? <coughs> and uh, how does what the companies do relate to what people do? Well, uh, obviously, ideally, they should eliminate vulnerabilities. Uh, so if Microsoft patches some vulnerability in the operating system, then that's best. And that's something that can be done without any user intervention or with minimal user intervention because the user may have to update the operating system or install the patch. But in most cases, this is impossible. Uh, so more often, what we get is that companies uh, block actions. So they filter, for instance, incoming messages, and they block messages that are identified as spam or as malicious. Uh, here, blocking can be entirely without user intervention, or there can be some user intervention in the sense that if people want to override the blocking, uh, then this is to some extent possible. And finally, we have alerts. And that's the most common, the most frequent way companies can help us secure ourselves. Uh, we have this in a lot of products, uh, in a lot of contexts. And this is also what I'll be talking about. Uh, this is also a field in which I'm sort of interested for a long time, not only in the context of cybersecurity. So I've done quite a bit of work on this. So, if we have an attack and we are subscribers to a company that promises us some sort of protection, who should be responsible for the damage that is caused by this attack? Right? Who should pay for it? For instance, my computer was inscripted by some ransomware, and I got the service from a company that tells me I protect you. 
who should pay for the damage that this ransomware did. Now, one possibility is to say the user is responsible. Obviously, this has the advantage that users will be more cautious. They will take care of what attachments they open, which is good. But uh, users may also be reluctant to use certain services or products. And that's the reason why we actually have this situation where credit card companies uh, actually did not, in the past at least, did not charge users for fraudulent use of their credit cards. Uh, although they now try to sort of change this to some extent. Uh, so, for instance, if you're using a debit card, you will be responsible for whatever charges are made. Or if you are using a two-stage authentication, and uh, or the fraudulent use use two-stage two-step authentication, you're likely to be charged by the bank as well. Uh, another possibility is that we have the company pay for it. Now, this will help us in the sense that the companies will try to minimize the damages. But uh, the other problem is, and that's a little bit in line with what Bonnie's has been talking about, where we may be flooded by all kinds of alerts where the company tells us this is dangerous and this is dangerous, which makes these alerts completely irrelevant. So the question is, how can we deal with this? And one possible solution is to find some kind of a mix where the, we divide the responsibility for damages between the user and the company. The question is, what kind of a mix should we aim for? So what I present here is uh, a more economic mathematical analysis of, the, uh, of this question. Uh, we are also running an experiment in which we look at behavioral paths. And as I said, this is joint work with uh, uh, Ronen, who is doing the legal aspects, because it's really an interdisciplinary problem. The sort of the basis of this analysis is something called signal detection uh, theory, the sort of the tool well, I'm, I'll be using it. It's a very uh, simple idea. Essentially, it means we have two states of the world, a message may be malicious or non-malicious, called here signal plus noise, or noise only. Noise is non-malicious. Uh, we have some variable we observe. And if we look at all malicious uh, messages, then we have some normal distribution of values of this observed variable. And if we have all, uh, so this is for non-malicious, all malicious, we have some normal distribution of all uh, malicious variables uh, or messages. So uh, the means of the two distributions are somewhat shifted. Uh, and the difference between the means is the sensitivity of the system or the detector. The larger the difference, the bet uh, better we are able to distinguish between signal and noise. Uh, how do we decide that something is malicious? Uh, we get some observation on this x-axis, and we compare it to some <coughs> threshold value c. If it's above the, th above the threshold, we say that it's malicious. If it's below the threshold, we say it's non-malicious. So that's the basic idea. Uh, so we have two parameters that are interesting for us and that I'll be talking about. One is the sensitivity d prime, and the other is the response criterion, which is, which is essentially the threshold. So. Uh, Let's look at the question of dividing the responsibility. And I'll describe a, a sort of a framework for analyzing this problem. Uh, we, have essential, we have two types of players here. One is the system, company, service provider, whatever. And this provides items to the user. So for the example, we can think of a, an email service that sends emails or forwards emails to a customer. Uh, and this service may issue alerts if uh, it detects the possible possibility of a malicious content on this, uh, I, any item it forwards. The second type of users uh, or players are users, and they can access items. Uh, an item will have some positive value, some benefit for the user and for the system if it's uh, non-malicious and it's being opened, and it can have a negative uh, outcome if it is malicious. The goal is to maximize accessing non-malicious items to avoid accessing malicious items. And in the context of what we are talking about, if you open a malicious item, then the damage is not only on the user, or does not entirely fall on the user, but rather 
the damage is divided between the user and the system, and so by some proportion R. So if you, R is zero, it means R is the proportion the system pays of the damage. If it's zero, the, it's entirely on the user. If it's one, it's on the uh, system. And if it's 0.5, they divide it equally. <coughs> now, it is possible that if the system, for instance, issued an alert and warned the user, the proportion the system carries will be diminished. So if you have, for instance, a small R of zero, then even if there was, if the large R is one, the total part of the damage the system will carry will now be zero. Okay? So it's sort of, the system is responsible for damages as long as they didn't take any precautionary reaction or didn't warn about it. So uh, let me describe the process here. Uh, just to, this is the process flow. On the right, hand, uh, right side, you see the screens in the experimental program we developed in which we can simulate this type of a setting in our lab. Or even uh, on cell phones, we, where people use their own cell phones to uh, access uh, the, the experiment. So we have a set of items, and these items have a probability PM of being malicious. Uh, we have a system that has uh, set a threshold beta, and uh, the system has a sensitivity D prime S, and each item is compared to this beta, and once, uh, once it gets through, uh, it has, gets into a list of incoming mails for the user. Uh, the user can now click on a mail, and if it is identified by the system as potentially malicious, it will, the system will issue a warning, uh, and the user will see this, and will also see sort of a private signal, private information about the maliciousness of, the, uh, uh, of this particular email message. Uh, so the user has two sources of information, the information from the alarm system and the independent evaluation of the system uh, of the message the user has. So for instance, if you get the mail message that tells you that uh, this Nigerian prince has uh, three and a half a billion dollars that he wants to share with you, uh, you will probably think that this is unlikely to be a correct uh, or a, a legitimate message and will not transmit whatever money he wants us to transmit. So that's, that would be the equivalent of this information here. Uh, so uh, when we, uh, we open an item, uh, we, can, we have to decide whether we want to download it or not. Uh, and uh, given, on, given the information we get from the warning and the private information. And uh, if we download it, then uh, there are two possibilities. One is that it's non-malicious, and then we have benefit U for the user and benefit S for the system. Or if it's malicious, then we have the cost of it being malicious. And it depends, the cost depends uh, on the value of R. So for the user, it's 1 minus R. Uh, and for the system, it's R if there was no alarm, and Y minus R times small r for the user, in, uh, and R times small r times cost for the system if there was an alarm. Okay, so we have outcomes, and the outcomes will depend on uh, the parameters we set. So now the main challenge is should, what should be the optimal values of this large capital R and small r? That's the crucial question we want to answer. Uh, there's probably not one uh, set of values that will always fit. Uh, what is the criterion by which we should choose these values? So we should choose them so that the behavior we expect the system to choose should be as close to as optimal, to optimal uh, as possible for the user. Okay, if we has, choose R so that the system will choose a threshold that will lead to very negative outcomes for the user, then that's not a good situation. Okay? We would like to have something where both parties sort of get the similar uh, benefits from it. So we computed the payoffs, the user payoffs and the system payoffs for uh, different combinations of parameters. Now, I'll just give a few examples. Uh, 
So for instance, here we have a user with a d prime of 1 and a system with a d prime of 3, which means so we have a system that is very well able to distinguish between malicious and non-malicious uh, items, and the user is less able to do so. And uh, we have small r of 0.5, we kept this constant. And we have uh, lines for different values of capital R from 0.1 to 0.9. Again, 0.1 means that the system is responsible for 10% of the damage. 0.9 means that it's responsible for 90% of the damage. And uh, what you see is that, that the, and on the x-axis, we have the system threshold. And on the y-axis, we have the user payoff and the system payoff. And so you see that the curves are somewhat different for the system for the, and for the user. But if you uh, look at the different curves and you ask where the maximum is for each curve, we see that for the 0.3, R equals 0.3 curve, if we this choose a system threshold of 0.73, this would be the maximum for the user. And this would also be the maximum for the system. So there is a single system payoff that will, would be best both for the user and for the system. So the, the possibility that we can choose something like this exists. So we can ask whether this is something we would like to have sort of enforced, the regulation that tells, well, that's the right way to divide responsibility between users and systems. Uh, now, there are other cases. For instance, here we have a smart user with a d prime of 3 and a system with a d prime of 1. And here, the curves look very different. Now, what's the best threshold? In fact, there is none. There is a no, a no best system threshold. We can choose two different options here. One is that we go with the uh, 0.1 division, where the payoff for the system and the payoff for the user are more or less constant no matter what threshold I choose. That's one option. The other option is that we go with another threshold, let's say, for instance, the 0.9 threshold. What will happen if I t t uh, choose the 0.9 threshold? The system makes the choice. So what kind of thresholds will it choose? It will choose a low threshold, right? threshold around here. Now this, for the user, this is not the optimal threshold under these conditions, but it's still better than the payoff the user would get with the 0.1 threshold. So in this case, the user may not have the optimal outcome given the certain value of R, but, it may, but he will still get a better outcome than under other conditions. So can, some conclusions, uh, system, user and system interests may be more or less aligned, in, depending on the parameters. Uh, we can specify a, a level of R uh, that creates better alignment between the interests of the system of the service provider and the user. Uh, if we implement such a mechanism, we can generate situations in which uh, the user, uh, or the system will assist the user optimally in coping with threats. And that's essentially what we would like to do. But to implement such a mechanism uh, requires us to deal with uh, major technical, legal, and organizational challenges. And I think this is one of the interesting aspects of this whole field of cyber theory. So thank you very much. OK, so we have uh, time for one question before we let uh, Itzik uh, uh, close the day. Um, Anat, yes. Um, I can see you, but, uh, So what exactly do you mean by system? Because system can be very complex and can be a lot of stakeholders and a lot of people that are responsible for that system. So in your uh, model, you're looking at it, the Yavis. The system is one and the user is one. Yeah, of course, uh, 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 this is very simplified. Uh, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, th this describes a situation where we have some kind of an information source that tells the user something about the risks involved in taking a certain action. Like IDS or something. 
this, this could be, an, uh, I mean, uh, this could be a, a single service provider who, who offers you to filter your mail for spam. But it could also be a much, much more uh, complex uh, system. Uh, and, and then this, there should be some rules that define how the information that uh, uh, is provided to the user is related to the relative responsibility for outcomes. Okay? Because if there is no responsibility for whoever pro uh, issues this information, we will have a different situation than if there is some responsibility. They will act differently, I assume, to some extent. Uh, and this may have effects on the user. OK, thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, so I'd just like to uh, thank all our uh, speakers today. I think the, those were three uh, fascinating talks. And I would like to invite Yaniv again. OK. So thank you, Iran, for uh, leading this uh, session. And uh, before I, I invite Professor Ben Israel to close the day, I would like to, uh, to thank all the speakers, we, we had a really long day and I'm really uh, excited of uh, all these uh, uh, topics that we, we have touched uh, today and uh, we, uh, we appreciate the fact that, that such uh, important uh, and leading scholars made all this journey to Israel to be with us in the Cyber Week and to participate in this uh, academic uh, conference. And uh, uh, the last, we really appreciate uh, your efforts to be with us uh, for all this day and to, to hear the topics that you are expert in and also the other topics that uh, uh, give the really wide interdisciplinary um, uh, perspective of the cyber in the academic uh, um, uh, point of view. So uh, it's my pleasure to invite to close the day Professor Ben Israel the leader of all this uh, Cyber Week and the father of the cyber in Israel. Please. Thank you. I will be, I, I will be very short. Just uh, this morning, I, I recall that it's exactly 50 years, 50 years since I came as a young student to the young University of Tel Aviv. And I, I studied mathematics and physics, but this is the first time in those 50 years which I think I start uh, understanding what does it mean to be in a quantum state of uh, electron. Being at least at three or four, time, uh, four different places at the same, <laughs> same time. And uh, therefore, I, you <laughs> I apologize if I'll talk a little bit more nonsense than the usual. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you for coming. I think it's, it's a very important event. I call it an event because the whole thing is called a conference. So these are events in the conference. We have more than 51 like this. I just come from another hall in which we have uh, uh, 600 hackers. Uh, very strange, by the way. <laughs> You see the balloons and things like this. Very different atmosphere than the <laughs> atmosphere in the academy usually. Um, and but I would like you to. I uh, would like to thank you. Uh, hope to. I mean, we still have one day to go tomorrow, and I hope you stay for the weekend to see the less less serious side of Tel Aviv, which is also uh, a phenomenon by itself. Thank you. <laughs>